Okay, um, are you ready? I can do, I guess, a short introduction. I'm not sure if, if it's yeah, really I'll necessary, see. but uh, yeah, so um, I'm uh, uh, excited to introduce uh, David Bergkamp, um, a grad student in John Neumeyer's laboratory, um, and uh, I'm eager to hear about his uh, recent um, work trying to automate microglia uh, morphology analysis. Um, you can go ahead and uh, take it away. Thanks, Charles, and thanks, folks, for tuning in today. Um, this is a, a lot of uh, work, but like kind of piecemeal over time, and so some of it may seem a little disjointed. Let me know if you have any questions, and um, happy to hear comments that people have. Also, let me know if something looks weird or you can't hear me. So the first kind of like foray that I got into automating microglia um, came about two or three years ago when we were doing a lot of IHC and discovering in the field how important microglia morphology analysis is. But to understand why, you kind of have to understand what microglia are in the first place. Um, and before I get into that, I'll just tell you a little bit about the methods that I've been working with. So the obvious one is like Fiji image J, which I'm sure a lot of, or all of you have used quite a bit. Um, the next one that I'm going to be talking about and comparing to today is MATLAB for image analysis. And um, I'll briefly mention Imaris, but I won't have a whole lot to say about it because I haven't used it very much. And then throughout all this, I'll be using Python to kind of manage data and clean data and produce figures. Um, but what are microglia? So when they are originally were discovered, it was not long after um, Ramoni Cajal had made his famous, now in famous um, drawings of neurons and the nervous system in general. So microglia at the time are considered like all the other glia to be glue. Glia literally means glue. That's just holding the CNS together. Um, they're actually kind of named microglia by this guy who's Pio, Rio, Pio del Rio Ortega in 1919, so it's, it's been over 100 years. And he was the first to like really, you know, call them a separate type of cell from the other glia. Uh, we know now that microglia are quite closely related to macrophages and are descended from the same lineage. So in mouse development, they begin as these um, these early macrophage progenitor cells from the yolk sac blood islands. And then by embryonic day nine, they've already started to enter the brain and become what will be microglia. And then in uh, animals, once they're born, those microglia will stay in the brain and macrophages can enter the brain and kind of come in later during times of infection or damage, but microglia are always there and they're distinct from other macrophage populations. Uh, and this is an image of a microglia interacting with a pyramidal neuron axon. And normally microglia will like prune dendritic spines or um, synapses and are important in development in that regard and learning and memory. Um, but they also will release inflammatory factors and try to interact with neurons that seem to be hyper or hypo uh, active in their firing patterns and kind of like surveil their surroundings. And, and when anything seems to be out of the normal range, whether it's more neuronal firing or less neuronal firing or damage, uh, microglia kind of kick into gear, um, eating up 
things that need to be destroyed or, or taking apart uh, synapses that are no longer being used or um, performing what, what are considered kind of like cleanup duties as the um, immune cells of the CNS. And this group uh, in a 2014 paper took a look at microglia in human tissue and there's kind of these four well-established states that microglia can be in. Um, the ramified resting microglia are considered like the, the base state um, where the cell is much more circular and there's kind of like spread out um, branches with these fine hair-like processes at the end. And then as there's more of a disease state that comes on. They move through primed and reactive states to this amoeboid state, which is considered the most um, inflammatory, where lots of cytokines would be released by the cells uh, and is more associated with um, a disease state in general. Uh, and this group, they quantified cell body area, and found that the ramified microglia have like a much smaller cell body, whereas like the amoeboid and the other disease associated states have an enlarged cell body area. Uh, and similarly, like there are changes in like, the roundness of the cell, like how, how circular it is in the cell body itself versus how like ellipsoid it is as well as the number of processes and the number of like endpoints that are coming off of and ending the branches that seem to be related to if the microglia are in a, a resting or healthy state uh, or an amoeboid and reactive or damage associated state. So that's kind of like why I wanna know about the morphology of these cells. Uh, in the Newmar lab, we're interested in studying them during opioid withdrawal. And I'm interested in if there are these big changes in microglia during opioid withdrawal that might be related to um, an increased inflammatory state when animals are experiencing opioid withdrawal, which we might be think is happening for various reasons. Um, so I'll show you some data today from animals that have been treated with morphine or saline twice a day for five days. Uh, the morphine animals got increasing doses of the drug uh, over the course of those five days. And then the day following day five, they got a saline or morphine injection and then either a vehicle solution or naloxone two hours after that to test if to put the animals into a state of withdrawal when they got naloxone, and then to compare the naloxone treated and um, naloxone induced withdrawal animals to animals that should, should not be in withdrawal or vehicle treated. And then those brains were collected after, and animals perfused, brains collected, and then sliced and stained for microglia. What you're seeing is a stain for IBO1, which is a reliable protein that is expressed in microglia and gives us really great images of the cells. So my major question again is, do opioids change microglia morphology um, to, you know, kind of like a, away from what we would think of as the resting state? And this is a, a Z-stack about nine microns thick uh, and uh, all of the images have been um, collected and you're seeing like a maximum intensity projection. It's like 30 images and there's a, an arrow pointing to what looks like a cell body for a microglia. In this case, there's IHC staining for the P2Y12 receptor, which is highly expressed in microglia. It's one of the highest expressed transcripts in the cell. And uh, this is tissue from an animal that was treated with 
saline and then got naloxone. Compared to an animal that got morphine and naloxone. And um, you can kind of see there seems to be already like some, some changes in, in the, the branching and how kind of like bulky the cells are getting. But it's hard to pull out these cells and you would you could spend many, many, you know, you could spend a great deal of time picking out individual cells and making sure you know where they start and stop. And so that's why doing this by hand is so frustrating and why I want to um, automate it using computational techniques. So the first steps for this is to pre-process your images. And so for that, I use ImageJ, and I don't know about anyone else, but um, these macros that you can write in ImageJ, I find are some of the hardest things to write. And it took me a long time to write one that worked well. Um, but you can open ImageJ, open the macro recording uh, tool, and then do any like manipulations that you want with a single image and that will record all of the commands that you use. And then you can take those commands and with a bit of uh, Googling and looking at Stack Exchange and other related sites, you can put together a, a for loop and easily save, you know, all the work that you perform on a huge stack of images uh, and process them all at once, which is um, super helpful. And if anybody is interested, I can send you like the image J macros that I've written um, or links for stuff if you're interested. Um, but for instance, like this macro opens up each image from a, a Leica confocal image file and it will split the images into separate channels, um, perform contrast enhancing, Gaussian blurring, despeckling to remove some noise, and then subtracting background to further uh, clean up the images uh, before uh, making maximum intensity projections and skeletonizing the cells. So you can kind of get a sense for how are these microglia spread out and which, which pieces are individual cells. Um, it's not perfect. It's definitely a, a, an imperfect method because you get a lot of like tiny bits that are unconnected to like the full cells, um, but it works pretty well. And um, in general, like for the, the ImageJ and Python based approach, uh, I'll perform these different pre-processing steps based on this um, uh, this uh, methods paper from JOVE, uh, where they showed that they can really like pick out individual cells, and then um, with this particular pipeline, skeletonize them easily, and then analyze the, the changes in the microglia between different groups very easily. So once you have a whole you know, stack of pre-processed images, that's when I then take a bunch of CSV files that are saved from that and process and analyze it using Python. So for that, I'll throw all the images into like a single folder and then open up Jupyter Lab, and that'll allow me to quickly clean up the data, uh, do any um, iterations that I need to in terms of um, looking at like vectorizing the data and like making any calculations that I need to make and putting together histograms or bar plots or violin plots, et cetera. I really like Jupyter and uh, Adam did a really good job explaining how to put data into like a clean format, which is like the most important part 
Uh, luckily, with a lot of the things that I'm showing you, like the data comes out in a clean format already, or uh, every single CSV, like from image J that I save is saved in the same format, so it's easy to clean it up. Um, so on the other side of things, what I'm mostly going to show you today is like a comparison with this method using MATLAB as the um, language and, and the software that was written is called 3D Morph. It was not written by me, it was written by this uh, woman, Eliza York, and it's published in eNeuro in 2018. And 3D Morph is like a really powerful method. So here's another P2Y12 receptor image that I took using a confocal microscope. And it, the nice thing about E, or sorry, the nice thing about 3D morph is that it allows you to separate out individual cells very easily. So this is like the output from 3D morph just like laid on top of the original image or the original maximum intensity projection. And you can see here that it, it maybe picked out either a complete cell by itself or maybe like cut a cell in half. Um, you can easily like fiddle with the parameters in 3D morph and, and get a better um, sense of like where it's cutting off cells. Whereas in image J, it's a little bit harder to do that because you don't get these, um, these figures produced where you can isolate each cell by itself that, that for instance, 3D morph thinks in this case that it's found. So like here's the um, branches of this particular cell that 3D morph has found. Um, and the other thing, nice thing about 3D morph is that it will show you all the cells together in one place. So if in the left of this image, it seems like there's a bunch of noise that it kind of collected together into one cell. And so I was able to, uh, in the interactive mode with using the graphical user interface, tell 3D Morph to ignore anything above a certain size and it cut out that noise that it's like putting together as one, what it thinks of as a cell in red on the, on the left there. Um, so then what the nice thing about 3D Morph is that you take one image and you make a parameters file based on processing that image. And then uh, you can quickly batch process all your other images using those same parameters and then go back through and, and see like how well did uh, the software split up individual cells uh, do you need to go back and and make changes or make different parameter files for different sets of your images? Um, ideally, if you've taken all of your images in the same way with the same microscope and all the same settings, you should be able to use the same parameters file for everything. Hi, David. Um, I'm sorry, I might have missed this. Yeah, can, go can ahead. you hear me? Okay, yeah. Um, but one question is, um, how many, how big is your image file, and how many, like for example, how many Z side Z sections are there? Uh, for everything I'll be showing you today, uh, they're all the same size. They're all nine microns thick, and thirty Z stacks each. I see. And how many? microglias would you assume will there be in that area? Um, so the so for the Z dimension, it's the same. For the X, Y, it varies a little bit. Um, the total width of each one is 1024 by 1024 pixels, but the in terms of microns, it varies. And um, for, for the data I'll be showing you here, it was the lowest number that I saw in the images was like five cells. And the highest number that I saw was like 15. 
Okay. And I might have mistaken, but so the program, does it segment the microglias and also do the 3D morphology um, segmentations? Like, yes, yeah. Okay. 3D morph will segment all the cells. And um, in this case, since it's, it's based on each channel that you have, so uh, like it's assuming that everything in, for instance, this case is P2I12 is the, the, um, uh, the protein that I did IHC for. So it's assuming everything in the P2I12 channel is microglia, which basically should be in the CNS. Okay. So did you see any like um, performance, difference in performance based on the density of the microglia? Will it be harder for the program to segment the microglias if there's more of them? Yes. Yeah. So the more dense the cells are, then, then the more trouble it has mm -hmm. as far as I've seen. Okay. Um, you, you get more um, kind of like smaller bits being segmented out that, that really aren't cells, they're parts of cells. And so you have to kind of like go through and, and figure out um, if that's happened to, uh, you know, an, an extent that makes, you know, your analysis kind of like problematic mm -hmm. or not. And that, that can be tough. I've been kind of like struggling with how best to, to do that myself. Um, but 3D Morph does have um, in the interactive mode, uh, a cutoff that you can set where it'll say like, here's, here's your image and here are all the cells that we think we've found. Okay. Uh, what is the smallest true cell? And then it will only pick the cells that are larger than that, if I that see. makes sense. So, so there's somewhat of automatic um, press shielding of the quality. It yeah. will, will you show the GUI or like, um, is the GUI capable of manually picking the the segmented glias? Or like just is 3D morph? Yeah, 3D morph, yes. Yeah, um, it, it can it can automatically oh, oh, you can't go through like by yourself and like choose each one individually. Okay. Unfortunately. So, so you have to set parameters in terms of how to quantify how many or to just verify the quality of the segmentation, basically. Yeah, yeah, you set like the max and the min in terms mm -hmm. of the size of the cell. Okay. And then everything in between there, it will consider a cell. Thank you. Sure. I guess for like, um, if there are false positives or just like small pieces that you that aren't really cells you could um and you might already have this is like in python um write up some code where it cycles through visualizes each um identified uh component and you can like uh, just reject them like delete them from the list um if need be yes yeah i i um i won't be showing that but that's definitely a possibility so like if you Say you have like different settings between parameters, like you have, you know, I don't know, three different parameters that you're analyzing your whole data set with. And then once you have all of your CSVs, you can throw that into Python and say, any cell less than this size, I want to kick out, or I want to consider, like, I want to like manually see each individual one that's, you know, between the size or that size. That, that's fairly easy to do with Python. Um, and same thing in MATLAB. Like I don't use MATLAB for the, the data cleaning portion, but you could use MATLAB specifically for that or build it into the 3 or more script since the whole thing is available to you um, via uh, the original paper and their, their GitHub page. Um, Yeah, I'm definitely not an expert when it comes to MATLAB. I do all my data processing in Python because that's what I'm most familiar with. 
MATLAB is a bit scary to me, but 3D Morph was very easy to use. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to jump into some of the data and compare uh, the image J methods to the um, 3D morph methods. And in this analysis, there's these four groups once again. So saline vehicle, saline naloxone, morphine vehicle, and then morphine naloxone. And it seems that, so this is the one thing that 3D Morph does really well that I couldn't really do well with image J was um, calculate this territorial volume to cell volume. And um, in 3D Morph, it comes out as a, a, a measure called the ramification index. And what you're looking at is, does the um, total distance that all of the branches in their farthest extent travel, so like the total territory volume that they cross across, um, what's the ratio of that to the actual volume in voxels that the cell takes up converted to, you know, in my case, cubic microns. Um, and so the more like spread out, but um, the less kind of like puffy the cells are, the larger the value will be, the more round they are. So like a perfect sphere would have a territorial volume to cell volume equal of one, because it's the same. Um, so it seemed like the morphine exposure kind of increased like how far the cells are spread out and how long the, the branches are. Um, but if you look at like histograms of like, all of the branches that were identified by the programs um, and their, their length, you see like some interesting stuff. So the image J finds many, many more branches, which part of this is it doesn't do a good job of like kicking out like a minimum value. Um, and once again, you could just write into your code, like I'm not going to accept branches below this value or whatever. Um, but there seems to be like a, an interesting finding here that I think is real where the total number of branches is lower in the morphine treated group groups, um, even if the distribution is like similar to the saline treated group. And yeah, 3D Morph, I think, does a better job of actually finding legitimate branches, uh, whereas I think the image J approach finds all these pieces of individual branches. Um, so I've got to work on trying to figure out why that is exactly and if I can improve that. Um, because you really do want to only look at what seem to be like true branches in your, your microglia. I like that at least the trend here seems to be similar. And then if you look at microglia density, we're looking at like the total volume of the microglia um, taken up compared to the volume of the uh, entire image. So in this case, you know, 1024 by 1024 by uh, basically 10 voxels. And uh, the image J results show a smaller amount of area across each group that's taken up compared to the 3D morph results. And I think that's because the 3D morph actually uh, tends to overestimate um, how thick the cells are. Uh, and there might be some tweaking that I need to do here as well, um, but that doesn't seem to be a huge amount of difference, although the, the range of the volume is greater in the 3D morph results, which is a little frustrating to me. Um, so other methods that I might wanna employ in the future are 
this one I found where they actually do everything in R and then image, image J in R, uh, which is similar to, I think the methods that I'm using with Python, just using R for the, the cleaning up of the data. Um, but this one is a little bit more integrated where it seems like uh, they did a really good job uh, making something that can like look at each cell very carefully. Uh, and then with MRS, which I didn't go over comparisons with because I'm still not um, happy with the results I'm getting from it. MRS is like really powerful. Um, but it requires that to do a lot more like handling of the data later. So copying and pasting either individually from each CSV that MRS spits out for your data analysis and then um, something that's really not easy to clean with Python or other methods that I've tried. Or um, I wasn't able to use this, but if you do like MRS, there's this easy XT, um, project that this group from EPFL made that allows you to run MRS using MATLAB. Um, and so that's like an option if, if you've used MRS and like it a lot. There's one uh, potential like use case that I can think of where MRS is much better and that's um, making these really detailed models of each cell. Uh, where I think it's much harder to do in image J versus image J or um, 3D morph compared to MRS. Um, yeah, so that's basically all that I have for now. Um, once again, like if you take your images that you get, first step would be to pre-process them in, a, in whatever way you want and I think writing a macro in image J is the way to go to do that. Then process it with whatever other software you are going to use to actually make the measurements of your cells. Um, take all of the files and save them as CSVs or some other, um, you know, easily um, easy to to program and something that's easy to iterate over quite easily in whatever language you're using, uh, put it in one folder and then process it using whatever methods you have. I like Seaborn and matplotlib especially, um, but I know there are some other options out there. Like there's a, an open source kind of like version of, that's version of image J that is run through Python that's been I've seen a lot on Twitter lately called Napari, um, but I haven't tried that one out specifically. Um, and obviously I still have a lot of work to go to like kind of like make this pipeline a little bit easier to use um, and to include some other measurements that I haven't looked at yet. Cause I'd, I'd like to compare the MATLAB 3D morph methods to uh, the Amaris methods, as well as the, the results I'm getting from this image J um, pipeline. Happy to take any questions or go over anything in more detail or yeah, just chat in general, take suggestions. Yeah, thanks, Dave, for the uh, great talk. Um, uh, really cool uh, work you're doing. And uh, uh, I think this is the first time I've seen someone like code out a full-fledged image today code. So that's uh, pretty impressive. Um, yeah, so we have uh, time for questions. Hey, David, I was wondering if you have any plans to apply these to uh, your two photon data and see if you can see changes over the course of a, a session. Yeah, ideally I would like to do that. And um, truth is like the two photon has been like a real struggle technically for me to just get up and running. And um, the, the technical, I think the, I think the image analysis will kind of be really interesting to see 
but I still don't have um, a good handle on actually taking my like brain slices and doing the imaging with them because I've I've run into microscope problems that I worked with Charles to try to fix and also um, uh, a whole bunch of folks over at NAEP and um, recently switched over to a new microscope here at the VA. So hopefully, fingers crossed that things work better now. We also had an issue with our mouse model. We were using a Cree driver line to drive GCAMP expression in the microglia. And we had to switch from a TMEM 119 Cree mouse to CX3CR1 Cree, which is very widely used compared to the TMEM mouse. And we think some of the expression problems we were seeing will get solved by switching to a different Cree driver line. Uh, I have a couple of uh, comments. Um, so I think one um, thing that uh, I feel like at, at the stage that um, uh, your work is currently in that will benefit from is, um, and you might have already done something like this, but a ground truth comparison, because you're kind of looking at this imagery version, uh, like a, a pipeline, and then also the um, 3D morph. Um, and I guess it maybe you're still like teetering on which one, right? So I think if you had, I mean, it might take a little bit of time to um, go through maybe one or two um, uh, like data sets to manually um, find each cell and then like quantify the processes and lengths and everything. But I think if you have that, then you can kind of have more confidence in saying, oh, the uh, which which um, pipeline is actually producing the most accurate results? Yeah, I I've thought about that too. Like I I think I really do need to sit down and just like take a maybe like four images per group and like actually like manually annotate them. Um, yeah, I I've really struggled too with. Um, I think I finally am happy with the, the pre-processing steps and like treating every image the same way before running the analysis, but um, it, it really makes a huge difference like in what gets considered a cell and what doesn't. And I think another thing is by doing it by hand, it might be easier to put together um, a uh, a deep learning or or more machine learning guided approach, which I haven't really done. I mean, this is all basically, you know, throw something into uh, a pipeline that that doesn't really like try and guess at what's there. It, it all uses thresholding and 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 basic image processing. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think being able to manually annotate them the ground truth and then that would allow for like building something like a deep learning uh, or um, um, more advanced, you know, machine learning type of pipeline as well, which would be helpful, I, th I think, so. Yeah, no, I totally agree. That's actually um, uh, something I hadn't considered, um, but you're right on that. Uh, that ground truth and training data set would be helpful for the machine learning. Um, and then, yeah, I think either way, um, when you like go put this manuscript together and you send out to reviewers, um, probably um, they'll be asking for some sort of like, um, yeah, like ground truth comparison. And I mean, it's that's something that's very typical and like the calcium imaging, like pre-processing pipeline, like segmentation, where um, you have that ground truth data set that they're uh, comparing to. So yeah, might as well have it, right? Yeah, of course. 
uh, this isn't really a coding comment so much as a immunohistic chemistry uh, question. Um, so can you always, like even when you're looking at it, delineate one cell from another? I feel like those spider webs overlap so much that even if you're looking at it straight in the eye, it can be hard to tell where one starts and the other one stops. Yeah, it's easier on, uh, um, especially with those maximum pro intensity projections, uh, it's it's kind of gets difficult, um, but it's a lot easier uh, when you have each individual Z um, plane that you can look at because you can isolate, okay, this is actually like a cell body here. And then you can follow the branches one way and the other way from that. Um, okay. I so, was, uh, I had a paper where I was individually manually filling dopamine neurons with oh, yeah. uh, a neurobiotin tracer because otherwise you can't really say where the morphology starts for one and ends for another so yeah i was just wondering if um if you are going the ground truth direction and i guess making things harder on yourself anyway if there's a plan to like uh see if i mean it, uh, when you have particularly dense um activation and like maybe in your uh, morphine naloxone groups, like the actual overlap would get uh, increased. It might be harder to see individual ones and uh, maybe filling up some individual glia with a, a tracer or like doing a sparse fluorescent labeling. Um, so you could separate them would be nice. So you could be able to say what the expected range in size would be and whether it changes in one condition or another. Right, right. Yeah, that's a good I yeah, I haven't I haven't thought about like the filling individual cells or out yet. Um, but that's, I should consider that. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a masochist, so. <laughs> 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 uh, I can try. I've, I've patched um, astrocytes. It's a lot harder than neurons. So I don't know if they'll even take up neurobiot in the same way that the dopamine neurons did. Yeah. I know I know of at least one individual. I think there are multiple, but like one PI whose group I visited out at Mayo Clinic, uh, he he's um, done recordings, EFIS recordings from microglia. Um, so it, I think it probably could be done. Not that it's easy. <laughs> yeah, I guess once once you get access to the cytosol, the the tracer should diffuse theoretically. On that topic, um, kind of just piggybacking off of Chris's, um, my other point was that um, the the pipelines that you're using, do they? Are they considering like each individual plane kind of separately in, in, in the analysis? Like, I guess one one way is just to do the maximum intensity projection. And I wasn't sure if like that, uh, I forget which program it was, maybe it was a 3D morph. Like you, sh you showed kind of a um, landscape kind of image where it looks like there were like hills and stuff. Was that taking into account like the all the planes um, like together, and because I was thinking that there are these processes that are like dipping in and out um, of a particular plane, but if you have you're considering all um, planes as you as you were saying when you're looking dot by eye, maybe the the algorithm could do better. But I'm not sure if it can accommodate like three D data. I feel like that could be a little more complex. Yeah, this thing. 3D Morph does um, consider each plane individually, which is nice. And I think that's why it ultimately does a better job. So ideally, I'd, I'd want to write something similar if I ended up going like um, the image J route. 
um, kind of like porting what they did with 3D Morph to ImageJ uh, because I really do think you need to consider each plane to get a, a sense of like where the cells start and stop. Whereas the ImageJ pipeline that I currently use, it doesn't consider each individual plane. It uses just the maximum intensity projection. And I do think that is where a lot of the problems that I run into, especially where um, you have individual like pieces of cells, like where you don't know how to assign them to one cell or the other, because it's just based on the flat 2D map of what it what it's assuming. It's assuming it's a 2D map based on you know this flattening that you've done. So um, yeah, I think ideally you'd want to use something like 3D morph where it actually considers all the planes. Um, and I've tried to figure out a way to do that in Python, like where uh, you use some open source tools that are freely available for any type of image analysis. And it's I found it very difficult to figure out like how to build shapes in 3D with Python. Um, I don't know if anybody out there has any suggestions, but every time I've tried to like render like a microglion with Python using like open source pre-built packages that I found, I have not been able to, to do it really. Yeah, I'm not really sure off the top of my head, but I'm wondering maybe like OpenCV or like, I mean, like even digging, uh, dipping into like the MRI um, kind of literature. That's a good point. I hadn't considered like the fMRI and that stuff. That's, that makes perfect sense actually. I can also get you in contact with uh, someone in the eScience Institute um, who I've posed like questions about like 3D rendering and stuff. Um, um, they uh, work in like uh, MRI and like structural and functional sort of uh, research. And um, I mean, they're also very like familiar with all like the different packages, uh, Python packages around. Yeah, definitely, I'd be interested. Okay, um, if there's no other uh, questions or comments, uh, thanks David for presenting. Um, I really learned a lot and uh, that was uh, great to see uh, your ongoing work. Um, and I uh, hope everyone has a great uh, weekend. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.